Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, CKJSV iLog E series. And uh, this is actually the third time we run this uh, global webinar uh, in uh, both English and uh, Chinese. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our uh, partners uh, who are very keen, of course, and also uh, Swiss Chamber of Commerce and the Australian Chamber of Commerce. And interestingly, that actually uh, two weeks ago, uh, Professor Li Wei, uh, our uh, associate dean for MBA program, had uh, uh, our first uh, global webinar with uh, Mr. Uh, Greg Gallagher, who is the chairman of um, American Chamber of Commerce in China. So, and I'm happy that at this time we work with uh, two other uh, Chamber of Commerce in China. And uh, uh, CKTSB does not need too much introduction uh, in China uh, among the business community because uh, half our uh, uh, 14,000 alumni are chairman and CEOs, and they are kickers and uh, you know shakers in China, uh, business who and who, uh, basically. And uh, it's very well known. Uh, our school is pretty known in, in China, but I'd like to emphasize that in addition to those uh, Chinese programs, the great Chinese programs that we have for Chinese business people, we also have uh, English language programs uh, for American and uh, you know, uh, executive senior management and business leaders from other countries uh, you know, around the world, uh, including US, Europe, uh, Japan, a lot of ASEAN countries that we run programs with. And actually, uh, last year we ran a program called Cutting Edge Insight from China, and we had uh, uh, senior executives from a very top uh, world-class companies uh, around the world uh, to participate in that program, and also some uh, ambassadors in China uh, uh, to participate in that program. And uh, more importantly for this one, and I'd like to, not, to say that we also have a very good uh, full-time MBA, uh, English MBA program. And uh, the speakers today actually uh, is a graduate from one of our, is a one of the graduates from our MBA program. And uh, since uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, pandemic uh, broke out, uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, challenges uh, ahead of us. And uh, while we're dealing with uh, those challenges, this crisis, we also saw a lot of opportunities. Uh, online education is one of them. And actually, uh, CKTSB has been uh, experiencing this change. Uh, you know, our full-time MBA class was the first one that moved our teaching from uh, classrooms, physical classrooms, to online, pro online teaching. And uh, we learned a lot. And uh, at the same time, I think people are really seeing a lot of uh, new opportunities for online education or ed tech, uh, in, the, in other words. So a lot of our students are in this business and a lot of our students are interested in investing in this business. And a lot of our students, especially the current MBA or current MBA class, uh, many of them are thinking of starting their own uh, online education uh, ventures. And uh, so uh, I'm sure uh, the audience, uh, among the audience, a lot of you are quite interested in this topic. Uh, so today we're very fortunate to have uh, several speakers uh, to talk about this issue with us. And the first one is uh, Cindy Mi, who is the chairman and the founder of uh, VIP Kid. Uh, we have now is a uh, unicorn in China. And uh, then we will have uh, uh, Professor Li, uh, Professor Li Yang join us at, on the panel. And on the last part of this uh, webinar, we are going to have another uh, person join us on the panel, which has not been announced uh, in, the, uh, in the announcement. And uh, so this, that's the sequence. And uh, during this, uh, uh, you know, Cindy is going to have a keynote speech, and uh, then we'll have, uh, you know, you are more than welcome to, uh, you know, uh, ask your questions in the Q&A, uh, you know, by clicking the Q&A tab. 
uh, on your screen, and uh, then we can uh, have uh, you know if we have time, we will uh, you know have uh, you ask the questions. Uh, Cindy doesn't need too much introduction. He's pretty well known, and actually. Uh, for doing this uh, webinar, I have done a little bit more research, and I realized that she is very popular on the internet. And she is also, if you want to know more about her, you can just do do a Google, uh, do Google Cindy Me and uh, Betty Kid. You'll find a lot of them, a lot of uh, uh, you know <laughs> uh, findings uh, about her. And uh, so, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Cindy. Uh, to talk to, to have to give her uh, keynote speech. Cindy, the floor is yours. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, uh, Cindy. You are still on mute. Okay, got you. Sure. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Dean Joe, for the wonderful introduction. And I want to thank uh, CKGSB for this wonderful opportunity uh, to speak to all of you. And I've read all your amazing questions and looking forward to uh, you know, maybe hearing more of your thoughts later on after this uh, panel discussion. Um, so I joined CKHSB as a MBA student about 10 years ago, 2010. Uh, and I've been working on online education for the past six years. But this time though, it's my uh, first online speaker uh, as a uh, uh, public webinar. <laughs> and I hope the job is as easy as um, the online uh, class sessions our VIP kid teachers are having every day with their lovely children to teach them English. Well, today I'd like to share with you uh, my story uh, and uh, the VIP kid story. Um, well, where do we start? Uh, I grew up in a very small town uh, in Hebei province, in, in Zhang Jiakou. That's about 200 kilometers uh, from Beijing. So to see a bigger world has always been uh, my dream. Um, and then uh, I didn't start to learn English until uh, seventh, sixth, seventh grade. So um, that's a middle school. Uh, but as a student, my uh, learning uh, wasn't a successful one. So my math teacher hated me um, in her math class. I was reading science fiction magazines. But because um, I moved to school from Hebei province to uh, Heilongjiang, Harbin, uh, the city is very close to the Russian border um, uh, when I was 14 years old, seventh uh, grade. Uh, and then, uh, um, you know, I find it very difficult. I, I cannot catch up with the learning. Um, and I think most of the reason, because if you think about the classrooms or uh, schools, it was the same 200 years ago and it's almost the same today. You know, students go to the school at the same time, they learn about the same textbook, they take the same tests, uh, and then they're evaluated the same way. Um, I think it is very impersonalized learning experience. And as a student who failed and dropped out of high school, 11th grade, uh, I made it my dream to build a global classroom with technology where children can be you know, the best of themselves while each child is very talented, and they probably are learning in their very different ways. Um, so um, there started my first venture experience. Um, I became a young tutor of uh, English language uh, teaching in 1998. So um, when I was still very young, uh, but then I co-founded that um, brick and mortar training center with my uncle uh, tutoring young kids uh, in uh, offline brick and mortar classrooms. Um, and uh, in like 2000, my job in the company was a CTO, uh, not the type you think, it's not technology, but uh, transportation. Uh, merely because if you think about how many English teachers today there are in China from uh, North American, um, that's about 27,000. And back then, about 20 years ago, you can find even way fewer, right? So uh, it's very difficult to find tutors in Beijing. And then I have to drive them uh, with my first Volkswagen Jetta car uh, to all the training campuses around the city. Uh, you know, Beijing traffic is very bad. <laughs> so I teach and I drive. Um, but then that doesn't kill the demand from parents who want their children to learn really well. If you think about the uh, childbirth rates, there are about 15 
million children born um, every year and accounts for a 200 million K-12 student population. So, you know, if 30% uh, can afford after school tutoring, that's about 16 million in China, right? So um, parents want high quality education. They want their children to be taught by professional uh, English teachers and then they can't find any. And also, uh, if you think about 20 years ago, 80,000 every year graduate from college, and today it's 8 million. Then you would have anywhere from 80 million to 100 million well-educated, globalized uh, parents who understands the value of learning a language, uh, getting to know more culture, you know, as all of you uh, in front of your computer screen uh, now is learning about China and CKJSC and the, uh, the programs, um, they want their children to have a global insight as well. And then uh, we don't have such a supply. Um, so, you know, after um, I worked in the brick and mortar world for um, 12, 13 years, I then decided, you know, with all the street smart, you know, driving a car on the street, um, the, how can we build a technology driven world where uh, a global classroom can be truly possible and that pain point uh, of parents wanting high quality teachers for their children can be true one day. Right. So with this question, um, I came uh, for support uh, at CKJSB uh, and, um, uh, you know, the, the, the two year experience in the school and with the exchange program and with my essay has been tremendously uh, uh, helpful to me. It's a, such a game changer. Right? So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Dean Zhou and Professor Lee and all my professors and deans uh, in CKJSB for all the support and advice uh, that I, they give me uh, throughout all these years. Well, especially I want to uh, share with you one little story. Uh, when uh, in 2012, uh, I was writing about my uh, essay, graduation papers. Right? So I came to uh, Liu Jun, Xiaoshou, right? Professor Liu Jun, uh, Dean, on uh, uh, my essays, and I asked him, so, you know, with all these decades of experience in brick and mortar world, I, I'm having, having such a difficult time transforming the company to online, to technology, can't find people, can't change the mindset of all the executives. What shall I do? And then he says something which I consider to be the milestone of me making the decision of building something new. He said, if you can't figure out a way to change things, why don't you be the change you wish to see? Right? So, um, you know, CKJSB gave me the world of uh, uh, the, the global uh, alumni network as a professor, uh, uh, as Dean Joe just mentioned, 14,000 of them, which I visited oftentimes to learn how they started their business and even in education field, but also uh, with uh, the Chuang Chuang, the entrepreneurial community that the school has built allowed me to uh, even learn more in uh, uh, 2015 when I joined, uh, you know, after I found a VIP kit to continuously to learn with all my professors about uh, you know, business. And then uh, it inspires me to uh, think further beyond the VIP kit mission uh, about education for common good, which I'll share uh, later on. Um, so I think, I guess that brings us to the VIP kit story. Um, in 2013, uh, that's when uh, I found a VIP kit, right? So uh, very luckily, again, um, with you know, CKJSB uh, parents bringing their children to learn uh, first at, at our program for the first year. And, uh, uh, you know, even Adam Steinberg uh, uh, and Lucan, my own classmates uh, from my MBA program, joining me, uh, you know, to build the company together. Very lucky. And then uh, if you think about the whole business model, it's uh, very straightforward, right? So the global classroom idea is that where we are able to bring online, high quality, passionate North American teachers to you know, all those children in China and beyond who wants to learn from the best and who want to interact with their favorite teachers every day. So technology has been the game changer, right? Uh, if you think about 2015, uh, 14, uh, when people don't believe people can learn online. We don't have Zoom by then, right? And, uh, uh, and then video conferencing seems to be awkward when we're still at a conference call uh, era 
of the time. But then mobile internet and then children getting access to their iPad and their parents' phones uh, changes everything. So um, today uh, we have over 700,000 students and over 100,000 North American teachers uh, that work with us. And this you know, global classroom where one living room connects with another uh, came to. This is um, probably one of the, the wildest dreams I, I wouldn't dare to dream myself uh, 60 years ago, uh, you know, building the VIP kit platform. And very luckily, uh, we have uh, over 200,000 uh, classes happening every day uh, on the platform. And then uh, the 100,000 teachers love VIP Kid and they even uh, voted VIP Kid as the, the employer's best choices uh, on the Glassdoor ranking 2019 as the number nine company in America. Uh, and then, you know, teachers really love us for the possibility that they can te now teach students from the globe and then they can make a very reasonable income for their families. Uh, you know, where as, as before, as a teacher, uh, they can hardly have any sustainable, uh, you know, great working opportunity if they want to part time and make a living for their family. So um, what is VIP kit today? Um, after six years and today we have about uh, uh, a million students now learning on the platform, not only the 700,000 on the one-on-one uh, -on -one platform, uh, but also the one-on-many -many, uh, with one on a thousand students on our Dami online school, uh, where we're helping elementary school kids with their math and, and Chinese and, and, and English. And then we have Lingo Bus, uh, where it's one of few program with our AI tutor program and one-on-one -on -one to teach uh, 30,000 students from the globe to learn Mandarin and, and so on and so forth. And, and finally, I want to mention that our rural education project today helps uh, a lot of students in rural villages, about a thousand uh, schools uh, to learn uh, for free. Uh, and then uh, they can enjoy this high quality education as the kids in the cities. That's about 50,000 students where our teachers um, uh, video conference the classroom every, every week and help them learn uh, together. Um, so um, Professor uh, Dean Joe wanted me to spend some time also talking about uh, uh, lessons we've learned, right? Uh, in business school, we always uh, want to talk about, uh, you know, the, the business models and how everything is built. Um, I think what I want to share instead is, uh, you know, things we could have done better or lessons uh, I've learned that is really critical and important starting from day one. So there are three things I want to uh, talk about. Uh, for the past six years, um, can probably uh, divide these six years into a, a three, two year stage. So zero to one is when I would say it's uh, 14 and 15, right? So uh, from the start, uh, it's very difficult to persuade parents to allow their children to learn online. So the first four students, uh, when I pitched the parents about this global classroom model, it took me almost a month. And three of them are children of our investors. And then uh, uh, every month, we're able to recruit about 10 students. And by quarter one, end of quarter one, 2015, we only had uh, 200 students and 20 teachers. And you can imagine, it is also very difficult to persuade teachers to think the same way, and not to mention uh, investors, right? So. Um, we were able to grow the business uh, starting summer 2015. And in 16, 17, the second two years, I would say it is when we grow really fast. Um, this is what I would call a uh, full window, where we grew at 20, 30% a month. Um, that's why that's the first lesson I've learned is when you had amazing business idea or business model, you probably want to keep it very low profile instead of having the word copycat what you do, right? So uh, the consequence though um, in 18 and 19 when everybody started to do the same thing in China is that um, we had to grow at all costs. It's, it's a very expensive to acquire customers. You've got to invest a lot in engineers, in product development. You, you do that anyway, but then in 
a furious competition, you invest way more than you probably would have to. And then this full swing opportunity, you probably want to keep it longer, right? But on the rest, retrospect, um, in 1819, we could have done more, right? Building more product and services for parents in this, you know, ever fast changing, um, you know, quickly penetrated market. But then since we were competing, uh, then we kind of missed some of the food window uh, found by the new uh, businesses and new startups of the field. So uh, food window, I think is really important. Uh, but uh, Fundamentally, I think the most important lesson I learned is demand and supply. It is always focus on your customer value. Right? In our world, it's student success and, and teacher success. You know, one thing is student success is what aligns everybody in our stakeholder panel. You have the parents, you have the teachers, you have the kids, right? And then everybody wants the children to have a very individualized learning. They want them to have uh, engaged in their learning, have efficacy in their learning, and learn very, very effectively. So in a word, if you focus on what the student want, for example, in the VIP kid case, uh, we focused uh, on what students need, high quality North American teachers. And this is also what the parents aspire for, for their children. So uh, they would then uh, work with us to build the business from day one, right? From 14 to 15, our first 200 customers or students and parents, many of them though, of course, uh, is from CKGSB, help us build the, con uh, the, 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 the product from concept to actual product that people use. And then, uh, you know, because uh, the adjustable market is, is huge, parents want this product. So that's why they keep referring new parents to VIP Kid, and that's what keeps us growing. So about 60% of our customers, uh, new students are from referrals, and that's because our parents keep recommending uh, the program to many more parents on, on WeChat, uh, many of the uh, social media platform. And similarly with our teachers, you know, why our teachers uh, rank VIP Kid as number nine in the uh, best employer's choice in Glassdoor, it's because it, it's perfect for a stay-at-home mom who, who's a teacher or who previously is a teacher to work from home. They, they, can, they miss the classroom, they can teach, they work in flexible hours. Um, they, you know, in this way, make a very reasonable living for uh, their, their own children and their family. And we value our teachers. We've uh, built them uh, you know, Facebook groups. Uh, our Hutong platform where all their questions can get addressed. We even have a call center in the Philippines to address all their uh, the challenges and problems. And, and we make sure we have very good communication with our teachers and we answer all their concerns. So um, up to date, there are close to 2 million uh, teacher uh, applied for the VIP teaching position and 5% got admitted. And then in return, we are able to provide high quality teacher services to our students, which then completes the cycle, right? So you really need to focus on customer value, the teacher success and student success for all these wheels to then start to rotate and, 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 and spin and do more. Um, so um, this is the fundamental lesson or a very important lesson that I've learned. Um, and lastly, um, it is the three, three things that are very difficult to have at the same time, but very importantly, my lesson learned is you've got to have it all as a company built to last. Um, so quality, scale, and efficiency, or in the other word, productivity. So quality is something, you know, when you focus on customer value, you always want to have. But then when it comes to actual investment in quality, like in our case, technology uh, with uh, a Zoom-like video conferencing system, which happens on our platform, um, you know, the um, 0.01% improvements means a lot of investment, right? And then uh, the continuous improvement on uh, that teachers quality assurance on student service assurance, but all these is what we were always been focusing on. But then I think in scale and productivity, uh, that's what I think we could have done better in a very competitive market. So uh, if 
we had a longer uh, full window um, uh, going on from uh, 16, 17 to 18, 19, I think we would have less competition and we would be able to invest more uh, in productivity uh, you know, compared to when we had to invest so much in quality and scale and growth. And I think people would tell you, this is difficult, right? And your team will probably say, okay, as a CEO founder, choose one or choose two. But then I think as a experienced founder who's been through all these cycles, and if you think about the companies, you know, in history built to last, you can have it all and you should have it all. You should make it possible for your team to allocate the right resources so you can do quality, scale, and productivity at the same time to, uh, to build a great company. So um, that's all the uh, lessons, lessons I've learned. Um, also uh, on um, uh, Dean Joe's list, there's also a question on impact of uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, there are three things I want to share with you on, on what uh, me and the team has been thinking and what encourage you to think about if you were a on education uh, uh, industry or uh, thinking about uh, joining the field. So one thing is it, um, Apparently today, online learning is a, a, a big, much bigger market uh, with a majority of parents, uh, students, and teachers, and schools even choosing to deliver their service online. And then uh, 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 Dean Joe just mentioned the CKHSB MBA program now goes online and, and students everywhere uh, are, are today learning on the uh, CKHSB uh, learning platform. So uh, just uh, a few months ago, probably it's, it's just 10% penetration. And today, if not 100%, everybody probably have tried uh, to learn online. So, but going forward, although it's a, a bigger addressable market, still customer value stays the same, right? So you have, you need to have great teachers, you need to have great content and uh, very efficient operating system where uh, your technology uh, can allow students to learn more effectively and more engaged. So it's the same thing. But I think um, in our data uh, of operations in the past two months, we've seen um, every month there, there's over a million uh, students uh, registered uh, as a free user on the platform, uh, taking our trial classes or watching our free content. Um, many more people are interested today. And also uh, in our non-for-profit online class videos on uh, so many different uh, platforms, over 100 million people have watched our content, meaning you know, parents really value online learning and see it as an effective tool for children to learn, on learn online. So this is uh, the first takeaway. And second thing is about globalization. Um, we saw a surge in uh, our Korean student number uh, when we had a uh, self-guided uh, website, uh, you know, standalone uh, in there. But then you, we saw many more parents, uh, although self-guided, uh, registered and paid uh, online and then having their children uh, learn with VIP Kid. Similarly with Lingo Bus, many more kids uh, around the world uh, are learning Mandarin on our platform as well. So I think uh, with uh, online education, uh, which allows uh, teachers, content, you know, technology made possible for online learning platform, uh, regardless of location and, and time, um, this uh, can be very helpful if we can bring it to more children and teachers around the globe. Uh, and lastly, I think it's about uh, a mission and education for common good. Um, I've never felt that online learning can be uh, accepted by so many more parents, but it means it's in need and in demand by so many more parents, wherever they are. Right? So the, the, the reason we uh, carried out this uh, rural education program, the thought is, you know, if the child is in rural villages, they deserve high quality education. Just like when I was uh, little and in a very small town in, in Hebei, um, you know, I want to see the world. But then here's a question. Um, how can all these online education companies help as many children as possible around the globe? As we can see after COVID-19, many more would need it. But then you see this opportunity of more affordable devices, more affordable internet access, and then in billion 
well, the number is huge, right? So how can we build uh, more with online education so we can uh, you know, really inspire and empower every child for the future, which is a VIP kid mission, but also uh, carry out more education for common good. Um, so, you know, that's the three thoughts I have there for you to think about. And finally, I've got uh, two videos for you and I want to show you live uh, on how our teachers and students fought for each other. I like a Sorry, can I talk to your mom for a minute? Uh, Are you do you have the virus? Uh, do you have coronavirus? Uh, yeah. I am so sorry to hear that. Oh no. I hope you guys get to feel better soon. If Sunny does not feel well, you can sign out of class. Class, it's okay. We can take the class on another day. I'll keep going as much as we can. But I know how, how ill people have been in China, and I have been sending all my best wishes to you that this passes very quickly. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I am so, I am so, so sorry. It's heartbreaking. Erica, many of us are praying for you. We will better. Yes, I want you to be better, and I want me to be better. I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, I love my children in China, and I want them all happy and healthy, and I want their families to be happy and healthy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So at any time, Sunny gets tired or sick, and you want to turn the computer. It's completely okay. I, I completely understand, okay? Okay. Okay, good. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very worried about people. So, Sunny, we're going to do the best we can. And I have a special reward for you. I have a special reward. Okay. Right, so um, what of, of this uh, student isn't sick, I think the teacher misunderstood, but uh, uh, with the consent of the teachers and the parent and the kid, uh, this video we showed to uh, our, our employees and many parents in China, everyone's so touched by how the teachers pray for the students and the, the, the love for each other. Um, and here is also another video for, uh, from one of our students. Hello, this is Grace. I'm six years old. I come from Wuhan. My VIP kid teacher told me that the virus is spreading in the United States. I hope my teachers and children in other countries are staying healthy. Remember to wash your hands and try to stay at home. Remember to wear a mask when you go out, just like Daniel. It's so easy. I hope you and your family stay healthy. There is nothing to fear. We will defeat the virus one day. Stay strong together. It's a beautiful video. Well, um, you know, uh, after the virus, um, our teachers, um, everywhere in the US and Canada, they gathered uh, all the masks they can find. They mail it to our San Francisco office or they mail it directly to our students and parents in China. And then many teachers send in their um, China Stay Strong videos, Wuhan Stay Strong videos. And then in March, our students do the same thing. Parents sending teachers masks, sending their videos to the teachers. And it's such a wonderful community that I feel uh, proud and, and, and lucky being part of every day for this global classroom. Finally, I want to say, uh, this is what the little girl just said, right? Uh, there is nothing to fear. Uh, we will defeat the virus uh, one day and we should stay strong together.
Well, uh, Ding Zhou, uh, I think that's that completes um, the presentation. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy, uh, for the great uh, presentation. And I think you uh, revealed the journey you had, you know, starting, you know, you, you, you talked very lightly uh, with a smile and with a laugh. Uh, but we know how hard it was for the last uh, almost 10 years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hardship. And uh, we congratulate you for the success you have achieved. And uh, also the uh, I think uh, the last part, we, 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 you know, a lot of people ask a lot of questions. And, uh, okay, uh, by, by the way, I, I think now I need to invite uh, Professor Li, uh, Li Yang uh, to the panel too. And uh, Professor Li Yang, uh, you know, uh, he is our uh, academic director for our MBA program. And uh, he, uh, you know, he has very uh, diverse uh, experience too, and uh, he, he studied, uh, uh, I think, uh, electronics uh, in China, and then he studied uh, bioengineering in uh, Columbia University. And his last degree was a PhD at, uh, in marketing uh, from uh, uh, CBS. Uh, you know, we also see the responsibilities. And uh, that's also kind of, you know, CKGSB has always emphasized that, uh, you know, uh, we are a business school, but we must go beyond the business. And uh, res social responsibilities is something we emphasize very hard uh, among our in our community, and especially to our students. And uh, we are the only, uh, we are the first business school at least, that require 48 hours community service for any degree program. And uh, we also have uh, introduced a lot of, lot of the humanities uh, programs uh, to, in, to the business school. Uh, uh, we are happy that uh, the world in a lot of uh, other, other business schools and companies are doing the same thing now. And uh, you probably heard that last year that the business round table, uh, more than 100 CEOs, top companies, Signed up a statement stating that the, the uh, in addition to serve the interests of the uh, shareholders, uh, they also should serve the benefits of employees and uh, clients and the community. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, Cindy to say, you know, uh, during this uh, in, uh, you know COVID nineteen uh, uh, pan pan pandemic, uh, you know, what uh, specifically you have done to employees and to uh, your clients, which you showed a little bit, and to the community, which you also showed, but I'd like to you uh, talk a little bit in, in a more uh, uh, systematic way. Uh, please, Cindy, and then uh, for Professor Lee uh, will uh, comment. Please, Cindy. Sure, of course. Um, so, um, uh, in about uh, right around the Chinese, in the Chinese New, uh, uh, new Year, actually, uh, uh, I, we started to felt uh, that this has such a huge impact on how we operate um, our business with our employees, uh, with our teachers online and students learning online even, and also um, you know, how this could have affected uh, students uh, you know, with their schools. So, uh, but we didn't know, um, you know the, the impact was uh, so huge uh, uh, and, and then, uh, but the first thing we did was uh, uh, we uh, really asked our senior executives 
to come back to our, our offices uh, around the third day of the, the Chinese uh, uh, New Year. And then everybody is still in the a vacation in their hometown, uh, abroad, people in Australia, in the US, in, in, in Paris. But then I was very proud that the team responded and then they all came back the fifth day. Right? And so that really uh, settled the whole uh, like fundamentals to make sure that we can operate in such a difficult time. And I'm very grateful. So uh, first thing is for the uh, uh, employees, we need to make sure that they can work from home. This is a huge challenge where all 7,000 of us work in the same location for the six past few years. And, but our, our, our technology team uh, and uh, our, uh, our uh, administrative team has been very brave. They took on the role. They made sure VPN is in place and everybody literally worked from home for two months until we officially started again uh, in April. So that's the fundamental, right? You make sure people can have income, then they, they can you deliver services to customers. And the second layer for the students and teachers, it is critical for teachers. Right? So we, we do uh, pay our teachers in like 400, 500 millions uh, US dollar every year. So this is a huge, huge income for that 100,000 teachers. We need to make sure they can teach online. Uh, in order to do that, uh, our students can learn online, is supported by our, our staff and our, our team. So we then make sure that our teachers uh, can, can deliver their work and they can keep the income. And lastly, as a social impact, um, after we uh, uh, fixed all the, the, the operational challenges, we then uh, quickly uh, on the, Fifth, uh, even the third or fourth day, uh, we put together a special task force, a team where our content can be uh, streamlined to many more. Uh, where we lastly had uh, over 130 million uh, people viewed the content on all these streaming uh, websites. And then we uh, donated 1.5 million online classes. Uh, to uh, students around the globe learning uh, all different curricula that we provide. Uh, and also we shared our live streaming platform. It's something like Zoom to schools or our other uh, training institute where they can switch their services uh, online as well. Uh, you know, additionally, uh, that's what happened in China, right? So in, in March, uh, we started to make donations to, to New York and, and California uh, to support uh, our teachers locally uh, and especially to those uh, medical supplies uh, for uh, uh, local hospitals. And then uh, uh, many more are learning with our mentoring program, uh, LingoBus as well. So I think that's uh, how we did uh, all the everything by uh, supporting our, our employee and our, our customers, teachers and students, and finally, a, a social impact throughout this difficult time. Excellent. Uh, Professor Lee, uh, you know, uh, Professor Lee is a uh, field is uh, marketing, but uh, also he, uh, you know, has done a lot of uh, study about, uh, you know, current trend of uh, doing business. Uh, Professor Lee, uh, any comments from you? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dean Joe. Uh, thank you, uh, Cindy. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me today here. And uh, uh, the question, like how companies, especially online, it's, it's a very big question and a complex question. Uh, so, so let me just first maybe mention a few things in general regarding companies' response towards the crisis. And then I was uh, talking specifically about the online education. Okay, so first, just to be clear, so the crisis is a global one and it's, uh, it's a huge, it's a huge one. It's a generation defining event that will influence how companies and consumers will behave for years to come. Okay, so it's, a, it's kind of a game changer, okay, for many businesses. Okay, so usually, so if we look, look, look back into the history, usually those companies uh, that has thrived after uh, a crisis were those who kept, who, who kept communicating with the consumers, with the clients throughout the downturn, took a more active role, focused on, uh, focused on the uh, through, circle, uh, through cycle interventions and acted with urgency. Okay, so these are the common features we have observed 
in the uh, in the history. Okay, so in line with this logic, so I think uh, regardless it's online or offline, so a reliable company, a reliable brand should, to say the least, supports its employees and uh, empathize its customers. Okay, that's exactly what Cindy's company uh, has done. Okay, um, so. I mean, uh, we have seen these type of uh, examples uh, since the outbreak started, okay, in China and outside of China, okay. Many companies, they are donating uh, money, donating resources to help the communities and then to engage better with their customers. And one thing uh, I observe is that they are not just donating money, okay. They are not just donating their time or donating their resources. They are also, also donating what they are good for, what they are good at, okay? For instance, uh, Lululemon is, is doing something like at-home yoga. So basically to motivate their customers to exercise more when they are uh, locked down at home, okay? And, uh, you know, like, a, like, a, like, a, um, like a Google, uh, Google uh, a search company, which is very capable in terms of technology, they not only provide free online courses on machine learning, but more importantly, they also provide the infrastructure, the solutions to enable uh, many schools and the school IT people to be able to do the distant learning. Okay, because as you know, many schools actually do not have such infrastructure in place uh, ready for this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So I think. This is actually a good good way, actually, to to not only to contribute but also to showcase uh, the strength of the company. Okay, what this company can differentiate from other competitors. And in recent weeks, we have seen that um, uh, dozens of Chinese companies, uh, their CEOs, their founders, came out directly in person to do online streaming to sell their products. Okay. So people were, you know, very excited to, to see these, you know, important people, okay, to do this by themselves. But uh, when I look at it, it's not only a, from a marketing perspective, it's not only a selling tactic, okay. It's also a way to make the brands, to make the company, okay, the image, the reputation warmer, more personal, more relevant to customers, okay. I think eventually how well the brand can continue to be relevant as their customer change during the crisis will play a large role in determining their business, how, how their business will weather the COVID-19 crisis and meet the needs after the crisis. Okay. So um, uh, as for online educator, I think the, 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 the general logic for handling the pandemic is similar and many of these have been mentioned by Cindy. Okay, uh, although online educators are not hit as hard as many other sectors, uh, and some of them actually are even beneficiaries of this, you know, from the revenue or uh, profit perspective of this, you know, outbreak. Uh, but looking at the long term, okay, uh, these companies should not be complacent, okay, this should still should be, you know, uh, uh, have much responsibility for their employees. Uh, especially their customers and the communities. Okay, um, so I think eventually uh, these actions will pay off. Not for now, but later, but later in the future, particularly on the branding front. So even now we're in the middle of crisis, I still trying to win hard customers, trying to win the battle of brand awareness. Okay, so how to do that better is uh, a big question for online educators to think hard and to move fast. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you both for the uh, for the great comments. And uh, yeah, uh, Professor Lee was talking about is actually is not only to do the good for the society, but it's also a kind of necessity uh, for uh, you know uh, companies to differentiate themselves from the uh, the ones who are really just the uh, care about the profit uh, uh, alone. Uh, you know, this is a, an opportunity for a lot of companies to make online education company to make a lot of money. But uh, you know, uh, is you have to think think of a long run, and you are responsible not only for the shareholders, but also for the uh, you know employees and uh, also the community. Okay, now we come to a really hard uh, business questions. Uh, you know, almost all the students ask. Uh, you know. 
Yeah, because I think Cindy almost almost like a role model uh, to a lot of our students and alumni, and uh, because of your success, and uh, they also but they are concerned about uh, the uh, uh, the big business model itself. And you mentioned that uh, you know uh, it's a one to one one on one uh, teaching. Uh, you know by definition that you know they feel that uh, uh, how can that be scalable. Uh, you know, you normally, you know, one-on-one on, one on one is a, a personalized uh, service. It's hard to be scalable. And uh, that's the question they, they have to you. And also they would like to know, I think, uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, outbreak, uh, you know, people see a, a big increase, fast increase in the uh, demand for online education. Is that sustainable? Uh, what uh, would ha happen after? People going back to the classrooms, uh, you know, what will be, uh, you know, how much the demand will stay and how much the, the demand will be gone for, for online uh, session of this uh, of this market. Uh, Cindy, uh, you first, and then uh, Professor Lee, please. Sure. So it's uh, a scalability and scalability. Um, I, I guess. Um, after the, the, the pandemic, it's not just online education, it's uh, the user adoption of online products and services. If you think about uh, the 840 million uh, internet users in China, especially on, on WeChat and all the other platforms, and then people spend on average over 90 minutes on a platform like Kuaishou or Douyin, all these short video uh, platforms every day. You see these assumption or adoption of online content and also the new way of learning. So uh, I guess um, with online education penetration, it's uh, still somewhere around 10, 15% today. No, even uh, 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 like today, people are, uh, parents are learning online because their teachers ask them to with their, their daily schools, uh, which is not operating uh, these days. But I guess then when you, when parents start to see the efficiency of online learning, and of course, there are a lot of problems uh, or challenges to be solved. Um, you know, Z Zoom or Ding Ding uh, or WeChat, online uh, like video conferencing is what's being used today, right? But then uh, if you think about all the potentials of uh, what uh, education uh, with technology can happen, like VR or AR or AI tutors, um, there's such a great opportunity where children can learn more personalized and more efficiently. So I'm pretty optimistic about um, the sustainability uh, only because of the customer value uh, that one can create with a technology-driven uh, learning platform. So, uh, and also, uh, secondly, on uh, scalability, I, I guess if you think about uh, Uber or DD, uh, it's also one-on-one, -on -one, right? But then uh, it's uh, the adjustable market on both supply and demand side. And then, although one-on-one -on -one personalized, but it is highly scalable. You can't imagine any single location with 20 uh, 200,000 classrooms, literally, but then online with a platform like Zoom, it's all made possible. And then uh, um, the, uh, the referral uh, with, as a user acquisition model, uh, make it also affordable to acquire new customers. And plus the viral effect of word of mouth in any Facebook, uh, YouTube-like platforms can help uh, the, the brand go further. So uh, that's what I have for these two questions. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lee? Professor yeah. Lee? Okay. So yeah. yeah, this brings up a very, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so I think it is a, a very interesting uh, and a very important question in terms of scalability, especially for startup, for tech startups. Okay, so I want to mention uh, a some general points and also during, uh, during which I want to also comment on maybe the, uh, the online education, okay, like, like uh, 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 very big kids. Okay, so um, scalability, basically, I mean, by definition, it means that a company can keep the marginal costs low or while they increase the revenue. And also the company can work efficiently with less in direct involvement of 
from its founder. Okay, so basically, can grow by itself and quickly. Okay, so uh, so I think several items are uh, pretty important to guarantee uh, uh, such a thing to happen. Okay, so first I think the target market. Okay, the targets. Okay, find, finding the target market is, with the potential is is critical. Okay, uh, and uh, the situation changes over time. I think when Cindy started her business, the target market at that time probably was not so clear, and uh, the target market at that time probably not so big. But at that time, I think it's it was very clear that people are moving online. Okay, people are moving online uh, in many different aspects. Okay, the mobile internet already the trend already started. So I think the success of Webkit, the very first thing is they actually had the right target market with the right potential, okay? Uh, potential basically means there are enough people, lots of money, and not so much competition. I think uh, Webkit was one of the very first, uh, er, one of the, ver uh, the earliest companies in China who, who, who do online English education uh, and uh, the two-sided market, so I think the the, 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 the got all this, okay? And the second thing is the standardization, okay? Because we're talking about, you know, efficiency and scalability. So I think standardization is very important. The more standard a firm's output is, the more scalable it is, okay? Uh, so basically, I think usually people are looking, for, looking more at the products, okay? They, are, they aim more for the products, not so much for the solution. Because you know, uh, se selling products, it it is easy easier to scale up. But selling solutions always requires some additional customization, which is often costly. So, how to standardize the existing operation? I think it's always a challenge, and it's uh, it's a particular challenge for education because education tend to, tends to be, especially good education, tends to be pers personalized, pers uh, t tends to be individualized. So how can the company standardize the process, okay, guarantee the quality, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is an important element in terms of the scaling up opportunity. And the third one is testing, okay. I think uh, because we are talking about startups and the startups always have, you know, millions of new ideas every day, okay. And owning a few of them can be put into practice and even fewer can turn out to be successful. Okay, so how can you quickly and efficiently testing your ideas? I think that is also very important for scaling up. And uh, you know, the idea of MVP, minimum viable products has been very popular, okay? So basically you, 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 you use a minimum uh, product, a small products, small tests to validate your business model before you get it right, before you ask investors for money. Okay, so I think that is also important. And another point is uh, outsourcing. Okay, because for startups, they usually face a lot of complexities, but their strength, their resources should be concentrated on certain fronts. That means they should also outsource non-strategic components uh, to the other you know, uh, collaborators, other companies, uh, other people, okay? to optimize their leverage, okay? Because uh, for startups, there's always a tight, you know, resource constraint, okay? So always thinking about, you know, where to outsource those uh, not so important, non-strategic uh, operation. Um, and uh, uh, the next item I think is the marketing, okay? Marketing is very important for big companies, but also important for startup companies, okay? so. Whatever you do, you want to get the words out, you want to get the message out, okay? So nowadays, people are facing a flood of information, okay? Think about every day, we see so much things, uh, so so many things, okay? So how can I, how, how, how can a target customer be able to see your ad, to see your company, to see your service? That's a very challenging uh, uh, question, okay? Uh, so different companies have different, you know, strategies. But uh, we should be smart. Uh, we should be, you know, flexible. Okay, there's no single, uh, you know, silver bullet to solve all the questions. 
you know, nowadays we often talk about the word of mouth. Okay, word of mouth, word of mouth is very important, but it may not work in all situations. For instance, if you are if you are dealing with low cost and high volume products, word of mouth probably is not that important compared to other things. But for high cost, uh, relatively low volume products, actually like uh, online education, dedicated online education, like uh, like Cindy's business, I think a word of mouth is uh, super important. Okay, so we need to think hard. Okay, what 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 type? Of, there's there, there there are millions of strategies. Okay, what are the strategies that are most useful for us? Okay, most uh, cost effective to us. And uh, the next uh, uh, item is automation. Okay, because we are talking about you know tech startups. Tech startups, you know, by definition, can do a lot of automation. Basically, uh, to let the computers, to let the codes, to do many things. Okay, so basically, the idea is automated to the max. Okay, so if a com if a, the company is still labor intensive, if the company is still staff intensive, so it's it's hard it is hardly scalable. Okay, by definition. Okay, so a scalable company. Uh, especially a tech company, uh, it must give machines. It must uh, let the machines do those tedious things, and uh, they focus on the most important and the smart things. Okay. And uh, the last item I think is uh, you know uh, for a tech startup is like define your business as an open-ended business. Okay. So no one has a perfect model at the beginning. Okay. As as Cindy mentioned in her story. Okay. At the beginning. He, she was wondering, you know, what to do. There's no, 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 no good solution, okay. And then the professor encouraged her to to provide the solution. And then they have done. I, I believe they have done many, many iterations during the process. So make your business model open ended. Uh, don't be uh, too confident confident at the beginning, but you you continuously, you know, improve. I think iterate. Uh, I think that's uh, that that will make the business more scalable. Uh, scalable, and uh, oh, uh, sorry, there may be another item. Item, last item, uh, the, the truly last item, is about the investment. Okay, so of course you work hard to attract and uh, the invest outside investment, uh, the money from outside, but also you you need to you know uh, appreciate. Okay, relish the outside investment. It's important to have money, but sometimes uh, but. But uh, but often it is even more important to leverage to make make use of the investor investors' expertise and the resources. Okay, so I think uh, these are the some of the you know uh, quick items that I can think about to make a, a tech startup uh, uh, more scalable. I think uh, most of them actually uh, speak directly to Cindy's success so far. Okay, thank you. Wow. Thank you, Professor Li. Uh, it's a very good conceptualization of uh, Cindy's business model. And actually, a lot of our students ask, uh, you know, the questions: uh, What made uh, Cindy's uh, business or uh, Wifi Kid uh, so successful? I think, uh, you know, by answer the question of uh, scalability, uh, Professor Li answered, uh, you know, basically, the, the, she, she, he had a very good checklist. You know what. Uh, and make a, a kind of startup, uh, online education, and uh, any startup in general uh, to be successful. And he was talking about uh, you know the, the right market, uh, you know the you know the first mover advantage, and uh, also standardization, focus, marketing, optimization, and uh, also uh, investors' uh, relationship. Uh, these are very good uh, factors. I think uh, you know contribute uh, to the success of. Uh, uh, with the kid, but I'd like also to ask uh, Cindy uh, if there's anything you would like to add. You know the factors that made the with the kid uh, succeed. Uh, you know uh, you mentioned one uh, factor which uh, you know Professor Lee did not mention was the uh, ecosystem of uh, CKGSB. Uh, and you talk about it at the at the beginning, and uh, but I'd like to know if there's anything else you want to add to. Uh, or, or, or comment on Professor Lee's list of uh, for, for successful uh, startups. It feels like I'm back in business school class. Also, <laughs> Professor Lee has a great summary. But one thing I would say is a uh, uh, mission that the team believes in, and also a passion uh, with especially the very early on uh, team members and the executives you, you build on the team. So I, a few. 
um, you know, humbled every day and that uh, at this era of the time that we're able to build this global classroom. But also a question we ask ourselves every day is, we're not good enough. We need to do more. What other value can we create and deliver to the students and, and teachers and to the parents? So um, with the right passion, I think that can be only found possible. Yeah, that, I think that's a very critical uh, you know, point for entrepreneurs. And uh, actually, that's what the key point that made uh, you know a lot of uh, our alumni, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter which generation of uh, of a business people in China. Uh, I think a passion that that's a word I use when I was uh, uh, teaching uh, foreign students. Uh, I said that uh, you know it d depends on why this person start a business. Uh, he or she start a business because it's a passion. Or because it's a fashion, you know, for a while starting business is a fashion in China, and uh, you can see a lot of them will fail because they don't have the passion, and uh, that's that's very important. But another thing I'd like to add is probably you know we talked about we we learn a lot about Alibaba and uh, and Huawei and the other companies that are successful. One thing that uh, you know uh, came out the same is their organization and their culture. So this is what I'd like to know, uh, you know, you know, Cindy, you talk about this culture, uh, the, the outcome of the culture, you know, when, whenever, when, as soon as you had a difficulty or that's challenging, you had this great, great team. And also, more importantly, how you build this culture, and you can spread this culture, uh, build this culture among all those uh, uh, teachers who are not uh, part of the employee, not on your payroll, they, are, they pay them on, uh, like a contract, uh, contractors. So how do you extend the culture to them? But, you know, you, you can tell that you know, the, the teacher was very emotionally attached to the, to the kid, to the student that he, he, she was teaching. But how, how did you make that happen? You know, otherwise people can be very transactional. You know, people you know, say, this is a job. Okay, I, I fill up my time sheet and you pay me a few hours, a few hours, that's it. But you can tell that, professor, that teacher went much more, you know, beyond what the city has to do. So how did you develop, develop that kind of a culture in, um, in, the, in your ecosystem? Right. Um, here's my thought. So I have to firstly give credit to people who are teachers, or right? teachers don't come into teaching profession to make money. And if anything, teachers today, especially in North America, make 30% less than what their parents generation would have made, right? So teachers want to be great teacher teaching global students. They want to be successful, they want to be helpful. So um, that gives us a very good foundation or ground of finding the right people. And secondly, I would say it's the team with the right mission and passion. And then the first 20 teachers, I found them myself, right? I uh, persuaded everyone and then um, they're the best. And then we send out more notes to more teachers and say, join the fun, be the inspiration. We didn't say make 10 US dollar 30 minutes of your time every day. Right? So uh, that allowed us to attract the first batch of VIP kid teacher heroes. They're, they're wonderful. And then on social, on social media uh, platforms, they spread the words and they say, we're the best and come work with us. And even with all the 2 million that I've applied, I, I, I want to give my biggest applause to all of them for uh, wanting to help kids to learn. But, you know, 5% uh, go, have gone through the whole process, the whole uh, uh, interviews and mock classes and trainings, and that's a lot of work to do. And then they all gathered. Um, they are, they're on Facebook, they're on YouTube, they're even on Weibo, if you think about it. 5,000 teachers sign up for Weibo and many more for which to connect with their uh, the parents and students. But then um, if, if you search on YouTube, you'll find 100,000 teacher-generated videos. So those are not official videos. That 100,000 are teacher-generated videos. But then they also have a few dozen uh, Facebook groups where a few hundred teacher volunteers are doing a lot of jobs. They're, 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 they're uh, sharing their experiences to the new teachers who's applying. They're uh, coaching new teachers who just came on board on how to work with Chinese parents. And sometimes it's 
difficult, right? So uh, it is the community who's made that, that all possible. And then finally, I want to say uh, it's uh, how we work with our teachers, how we um, you know, deliver our service to the teachers so they can be the best to the students and, and, and encourage them probably to uh, do what they do today. We make sure they're, they're very well respected. We pay them. Uh, now, not just on time, but we also all the time strive to do better. We used to pay every month and now we pay bi-weekly. We are even thinking about faster pay later on. We have all the uh, platforms so they can have all their questions answered in time. So I guess it is the ecosystem that you mentioned, uh, but operated in the culture that we wanted. And then in return, teachers uh, go beyond our expectations and they even put together teacher conferences. It's like just like the Xiaomi uh, right? with all the like a few hundred teachers gather in a city every quarter to celebrate their journey uh, with NK. Okay, so it's uh, almost like a team building with a uh, virtual team uh, around the world. And teachers do it for free, but they just, and it's the Chinese parents' passion also to respect the teachers and the children. Oh, wow saying all these nice words and say, teacher, I love you in the classrooms, I guess. But it all come back to why teachers become teachers. Okay, excellent. Yeah, there's, you, you mentioned that uh, most of your teacher, a lot of your teachers are in the US and Canada, of course. And, uh, but now it's akin to, you know, a lot of our students also ask this question, which is also my question you, to you too. You know, uh, with this kind of, uh, you know, hit rhetoric uh, about uh, decoupling, and also a lot of people are seeing uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, symbolize or accelerate uh, the end of uh, globalization. Uh, but what you said, you know, I noticed that you, the, uh, the cover page of your PowerPoint is a global kid, global classroom. And the uh, VIP kid will remain a global uh, company. And, but how do you react to uh, these kind of uh, statements? Uh, you know, there's uh, you know, also the atmosphere uh, that is uh, not uh, that favorable uh, to the uh, business, re business relationship between the two countries, primarily between China and the U.S., uh, where you have, a, you know, in China you have most of your students, in the U.S. you have your most teachers. And, uh, you know, how do you see this uh, overall situation? And, uh, I, you know, I'd like you to, Talk about Cindy and uh, Professor Lee will uh, give his view about uh, you know uh, what's happening uh, with uh, the globalization. Please, Cindy. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think during this difficult time, regardless of the you know what you mentioned, end of globalization for business world, I would say the world of learning uh, stays the same, and it's more than ever before that we find teachers encouraging students love them and students in return encouraging teachers and give them uh, a reason to keep on. I think this is what we mean by this global classroom, right? And then I think in this difficult time, it is love that will keep us all alive. Okay, that's a great uh, answer. Uh, Professor Lee, you know, from you, uh, you know, okay. Sure. Business perspective yeah. or business yeah. education perspective. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. First, thank you for this question. Yeah, it, this, as you can tell, this is a highly sensitive and a highly complex issue. Okay, I'm not a professor of international politics, and Cindy is, uh, you know, just running one one company. Okay, uh, not running, you know, like like a big government. So it's a, uh, it's hard for us to see or to handle the whole picture. Okay, but I guess we will see just just assess the situation from our. Uh, our own, you know, uh, observations. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, but I, I, you know, in my ear, because I have been always the advocate of uh, globalization, and uh, I think uh, sure, sure. this uh, business is good, good example. Yes. And yes. You can yeah. Try yeah. Let, let, let me, let me, maybe, maybe I, I continue uh, yes, and uh, just, just to uh, share my view. Okay. So yeah, it's true that I think this uh, uh, the, the glo globalization takes a hard hit because of the pandemic, okay? Uh, because of you know the uh, the lockdowns and the, the limitation of travels, etc., etc. Okay, um, 
yeah, but I still, uh, I, I, my, I, I myself still, you know, keep a little bit, I still keep some faith in globalization, especially if we look across all the sectors that already have, you know, strong footprints on the global stage, okay? If we look across all those industries and sectors, internet industry is probably the least affected one and, and also the most resilient one in the process of globalization. Okay, because the fundamental definition of the internet is global. Okay, it is about you know doing business without geographic boundaries. Okay, that's the original definition of the internet. Um, although such definition or the nature of the internet is always being challenged, but I mean compared to other sectors such as trade, such as you know agriculture, as oil, I think the connections built by internet companies will be most able mostly able to survive through the pandemic through the disease through the uh, political turmoils okay uh because i think the uh fundamentally uh, you know internet companies are run by younger and more open-minded people okay they are run by true entrepreneurs okay and uh, these entrepreneurs maybe they have different nationalities Maybe they use, they speak different tones, but actually they use the same language everywhere in the world to build up their business. With the same language, I mean C, C++, Java, Python, Julia, and so forth, okay? So you all use the same tools to deal problems of the society, of the economy, okay? So you all share similar business models, okay? Uh, so I think, even though globalization is taking a hit, but internet industry will be most likely to survive and to, you know, to, to further develop after the uh, pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, actually uh, what uh, I saw from uh, the video that uh, Cindy played, uh, it reminded me of uh, an uh, old song uh, during the Cold War between Russia and uh, Soviet U former Soviet Union and, uh, and, and the US, actually it's an American song, it says the Russians love their children too. And uh, yeah, I would say the Chinese people love their children even better, even more. And uh, also you can see from the American teacher, the American teachers love their children, love children too. So uh, with that love, I think, uh, you know, uh, people are continue to be emotionally uh, you know uh, bounded to each other and uh, so that's what uh, uh, with that I'd like to invite uh, our next uh, uh, panelist and uh, whose name is Lina uh, you know he is a uh, how say his uh, Chinese name is Lina but uh, we just learned that actually there are three Linas in at least three Linas in uh, among the Chinese among CKGSB alumni one of them uh, is uh, the uh, tennis champion, uh, world champion, uh, Lina. And uh, he, she is our EMBA student, graduate. And uh, there's another uh, EMBA graduate uh, Li, uh, by the same name from Lina. Uh, this Lina is uh, from uh, Ethiopia and uh, from Africa. And uh, she did her bachelor degree and the master degree at Yale and a uh, very distinguished student from Yale. And uh, we were, you know, then she moved to China uh, before she became a student of our MBA class. She was working for a multinational, very well known multinational. And, uh, but she started her own business. Uh, you know, I'd like to invite her, uh, just, uh, you know, talk a bit more, a little bit about her venture and uh, let her to have uh, her, you know, her questions or her classmates questions to Cindy directly. Uh, Lina, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Lina and Cindy Me at Star Panel. Um, unfortunate that uh, we have to do this talk online, but also convenient uh, because I'm in Atlanta. Um, this is not Ethiopia. Of I hope one day we will have a skyline like that. Um, but for me, you know, education has been such a defining, life-defining um, asset in my life. Um, my parents did not graduate from college. And so for me and my sisters, the dream was always to, to get a very good education, not only 
before our lives, but also for the future of our country. So I'm very passionate about this. Um, and a lot of my questions and comments uh, do not assume that uh, we can foresee what uh, the result of this epidemic or of this pandemic will be. Um, currently, for example, in Ethiopia, where I'm from, there are three confirmed deaths from the, from the pandemic, but we do not know the impact on industries, including in the education industry, uh, other than, you know, currently schools being closed. So uh, basically, I, I, my goal is right now for this um, few minutes that we have is to bring the perspective of a less developed region but also a very young region that is very ripe for investment in the education sector. If you take my country, for example, 40% uh, of the nation, uh, four zero, is under 14 years old. So young, very young uh, people. And 60% is under 24 years old. So we are a very young nation and the education um, industry, the, the, the infrastructure in terms of what uh, our governments are able to offer us are not keeping up with the ambitions and the potential of the young people in the continent. So, um, in the, not only my country, but the whole of Africa, because it, Africa is now the youngest continent. So my question, because you you understand um, China, China's market, and how how uh, the country was able to accelerate really quickly um, uh, in terms of education and was able to to educate a large population in a very short and, and a period of time, and especially now with the with the with technology, I wanted to understand what you thought about. Um, uh, investing in low resource regions such as uh, such as in Africa um, and also um, what requirements uh, need to be fulfilled um, in order for companies like VIP kid to look at Africa as a viable market um, and um, you know right now Chinese companies are investing a lot in the African continent um, I keep track, very close track of what's happening, and um, it's very rare that there is any intervention in the education sector beyond Chinese language training in the Confucius Institutes um, and some media-related content uh, intervention. So I wanted to understand what your vision was. Thank you. Okay. Uh Thank you, Lina. Uh, so I think by investment, you probably mean two things. One is uh, you invest uh, in uh, uh, companies in Africa. Then secondly is uh, you invest in the market so that we can provide the product and services uh, to uh, consumers or customers in the, in the continent. Uh, so I would say I have very limited uh, knowledge on uh, what the, the customers or students uh, demand or their, their pain points or, or learning is. But what I think I can share is um, people need to learn languages, right? So that if they want to learn English or Mandarin, uh, what comes to my mind uh, as a uh, marketable product is um, you know, when we're able to deliver uh, at scale with a very reasonable, uh, affordable cost with our AI tutor or group class model. Uh, that's probably uh, when to consider to launch in a market like this and also as a philanthropic uh, effort uh, for our non-for-profit programs. Uh, I, I guess, I, I, I believe there are a lot more opportunities where you know, we'll be very happy to partner with uh, local institutes and organizations to help more children. And if you think about this 100,000 teacher pool, um, I'm, I'm sure many of them would love to help children in the continent to, to learn better. So uh, that's the first thing. And secondly, as um, a financial uh, investor or investments, uh, um, I probably need to learn more uh, on uh, what are the parameters to consider. And uh, that's uh, when I think uh, the CKGSB alumni network where classes are really valuable, where um, you know, 
uh, this is something if I haven't met you, probably I need to learn uh, in years, but I would love to spend more time um, after the session in the future to learn more so we can uh, maybe work together somehow. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cindy and uh, Lina. Yeah, uh, Lina, uh, you know, I noticed that a lot of uh, other, uh, uh, your classmates ask the question, and I think that's your question too, when I talked to you, was uh, the first team. Uh, you know, how do you hire the first, how do you find your partners? How do you find your, your first group of uh, key executives? Uh, is that right, uh, Lina? Yes, and I want to say that um, since uh, CKGSB, um, I, you know, our team has grown very, very in a very significant way because one of my classmates, uh, Clement, who's um, who has a very uh, diverse background in tech, and I am, you know, it completely complements me because I'm on the other, and I'm technologically challenged. I'm, so, um, so the team I found is a very important aspect, and CKGSB has helped me find someone I think is a, is an asset. And I wanted to also ask Cindy and also uh, both of you guys to to understand what you think is a core. How do you find your core people? Your first your first garage team, you know, when you're in a garage and you have no idea if this is going to work. Right. I think uh, as a founder, we're lucky to, to have people even wanting to join us at the garage stage, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, with the CQJSB community, I had two of my classmates join uh, and five others uh, from the community uh, that joined as a as team. Uh, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, not to mention the, the parents and the students. But then I think if I have to conclude um, uh, some sort of uh, concept or idea, I would say it's still the mission and passion. Right? So people, aside from the skills and experience who truly believes in uh, the mission and passion are willing to reflect and change. And no matter how good you've, you've done, how far you've gone, if you think about that mission and passion, you still feel insufficient. You, feel, you still feel you know, far from good. You want to make a change no matter how long you've been doing this, no matter how good you've been doing this. And this is uh, the value I find will keep uh, work together long enough and good enough to build that uh, enterprise. Yeah, uh, with that, I would like also uh, to share with uh, Cindy and uh, after you graduate, uh, we've been thinking how we can help the people like yourself better during the our pro MBA program. And uh, we had this experiment uh, this year uh, to have uh, everyone, as long as they want, to write a, a business plan from the very beginning mm -hmm. and to put up their business ideas on paper uh, so that uh, they can have this business plan in mind and then take uh, courses from uh, people like uh, Professor Lee. And after each module, they are gonna revise their business plan. And uh, actually, uh, we notice uh, the change, uh, the significant improvement uh, by mm -hmm. Lina. And uh, you know, each time we have, uh, uh, you know, I would uh, be on the panel and also uh, my colleagues invite a real VC uh, person uh, on the panel, so we will, review their business plan and give their uh, our observations and suggestions and uh, at the second time right now we have already done uh, twice uh, the second time you know lina still uh, talking about her business but in a very you know very professional way uh, talking about her business plan like a like a like a somebody from a vc and but there are also other uh, classmates uh, have you know find out that their first business plan probably not that uh, feasible, and they started presenting another one, another business plan. And I, I'm very happy that uh, you know I see the improvement uh, a lot of them. And after taking courses uh, from uh, you know, one module after one after two modules, they build up the what did they learn into the business plan. And that's uh, actually what uh, uh, what I'm expecting. Uh, actually, uh, Lina is going to do another one. Uh, you know, maybe. You know, you can tell us uh, the progress you've made since the last time uh, you, we had this, uh, we call it uh, in-class incubator. We incubate the people's uh, mm -hmm. skills. Not only, we do not provide only the, the money. Uh, if they are successful, the VC would be happy to invest, 
but we would like to incubate the, our students' skills uh, and understanding of real business. Doesn't matter if uh, they are going to work for somebody else or they are going to start their own business, but I really feel that's a good way for them to understand the real business so they can be more valuable when they graduate uh, to their own ventures or to the companies they are working, uh, they, are, they are going to work with. Uh, Lina, any uh, you know, uh, experience you want to share uh, with uh, the audience? Yeah, I think that um, what has been valuable for me in terms of refining and piloting and doing small steps like, uh, like Professor Lian said, in terms, of, in terms of developing an MVP, uh, like minimum viable product, is the focus on um, trying as much as possible to make it sustainable. Because like um, uh, Cindy, uh, Cindy Mee just mentioned, um, it's, you know, you, you, in order for the market to be viable, you need to invest in a lot of things, but at least to be self-sufficient and to last longer, there needs to be an element of sustainability. And that was something that I think was really forced to, we were really forced to confront in, in the incubation period. Um, and I hope that, you know, the resulting project will result in uh, a project that can run on its own. Because even if it has like philanthropic elements of helping people or helping disadvantaged people who may not, you know, who may not be able to pay a large amount, but maybe they can make that up in volume, or there are certain segments that will be uh, able to be monetized well. So really that, that has been a, a something that I had to open my eyes to. Um, especially now, um, we don't know what the economic impact of COVID-19 is going to be and how it's going to affect uh, investment, um, how, it's going to, uh, how it's going to impact philanthropy. We don't know. Maybe people will be more generous or maybe people will do so much money that they won't be generous anymore. So in order to shield the project from that, I think being self-sustaining is important. And my professor, uh, Dean Joe, was really forcing us to think about that. So hopefully the resulting product will benefit. All right, thank you. Okay, we are about to uh, you know, run out of time. I'd uh, like to you know, uh, mention that uh, you know, so many people have been inspired by Cindy. And uh, uh, even among the, you, know, you remember that the last time we met each other was in your company. And I took a group of, uh, you know, executives from uh, around the world uh, to your uh, to VIP kit uh, for our uh, cutting edge insight from China program. And uh, a lot of them are online today. And, uh, you know, some of them are even inspired by you and starting their online business too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we really appreciate your time and your insight and your experience. And uh, so, I'd like to give everyone, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to say, you know, uh, make the last statement to our audience before I conclude. Uh, Cindy, do you, do you want to go first? Uh, two sentences. One is, um, you know, whatever is facing us a difficult time, build uh, the global classroom as we do today, but build a bigger world for, you know, all the children for the future. And uh, secondly, uh, choose to learn with CKJSB. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to know China more and then uh, yeah, in that order, build the world better. Okay, thank you, Cindy. Uh, Professor Lee, you need to unmute yourself. You're on mute. You're still on mute. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, CKGSB is the place for entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Cindy is uh, one great example and uh, we have, uh, we have, we have a lot of students uh, inspired by Cindy and then many are on the way to become another Cindy, to have another very... Okay, uh, you, you've got to cut off. Uh, okay, uh, Lina, you go ahead. Anything okay. from you? 
And just just one thing, I just think that we learned for, through this pandemic that the world is actually very connected. And so hopefully we can also find many shared um, solutions to many problems that affect all of us. So okay, Professor Lee, uh, you, you're the, the last sentence, uh, sorry, uh, Lina, finish. Uh, I just want to go back to the Professor because he was broken. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. You finished? No, I, I was Go ahead, Alina. Oh, I was just going to say that um, the, the the one big lesson for me personally about the pandemic was that it's a, a our world is very interconnected, and we must acknowledge that a lot of our problems are shared problems. So hopefully, it means that we can solve them together, and so that's my big lesson. So hopefully, we won't forget this when this is over. Great, thank you, mm -hmm. Professor Lee. Uh, you were broken. Uh, you, 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 the, 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 the voice was broken uh, for your last uh, statement. Oh, like sorry. Speak? Yeah, probably my internet connection was not that great. Yeah, I was uh, just saying that. Yeah, yeah. I was just saying that. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I hope people will join us. Uh, you know, because uh, we are very entrepreneurship oriented school, and uh, yeah. Uh, there are many people they have the same inspiration like inspiration like Cindy and uh, yeah I actually I want to make one quick point because I saw in the in the message parts so there are actually a lot of messages I think many audience actually they are very interested in the conversation and they ask a lot of questions but in the interest of time probably we cannot respond to all of them uh, actually, many of the questions I see are actually about the basics of VIP kit, like how they recruit students, how they recruit teachers. So I would encourage those audience, if you can just go on to, I, I think just go on to VIP kids, uh, you know, website, probably you can get many of such information. And if you need, if you need actually a re response, actually, I think uh, either Cindy, Cindy's company or CKJSB, we are very happy to provide further response to the questions. Yeah, so we want to, you know, continue the discussion. Yeah, into the Thank future. You. Cindy, yeah. you are the uh, you, let, you are on the uh, what's that called the uh, uh, World Economic Forum uh, uh, Global uh, Young Global Leaders Class. Uh, yes, I'm eighteen, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, it's a very good, big honor. And uh, I happen to know uh, one of your classmates uh, whose name is uh, Zhang Lu or Lu Zhang. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know her. Yeah, of course, I know her. You know her, okay. So I, you know, she has a very good uh, thing and she is a Stanford graduate and uh, now, uh, you know, running her own fund, multi-billion dollar fund too, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley. And she has a saying I would like to, you know, uh, share that with all the audience, uh, which is, uh, change to the world while become rich. But the most important thing is to change the world. Right. So with that, I'd like to, you know, invite those people who have the ambition to change the world and also become rich and uh, to join us. And uh, as Professor Lee said, you know, we are very entrepreneurial. And, but uh, in my view, entrepreneurship is not only for people who start their own companies. It's also important for people who work for responsible companies too. And uh, that's my dream that, uh, you know, the success of our MBA and other programs is when, we, when there's a new products, new, tech, new market to develop, uh, you know, even the uh, established companies, the first thing they think about is uh, people who have studied at the CKGSP. So with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you all and uh, all the panelists and also our partner, you know, Vatican Kid, Swiss uh, Chamber of Commerce and the Australian Com Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, you know, you're, I hope to see you, uh, you know, either online next time or better in the classroom next time. All right. With that, thank you again, and uh, stay well, stay safe, wherever you are, and uh, all the best. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.